Good morning. The Old Testament lesson is found in Jeremiah chapter 11. The Lord made it known to me, and I knew. Then you showed me their deeds, and I was like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter. I didn't know, I did not know it was against me. They devised schemes, saying, Let us destroy the tree with its fruit. Let us cut off him from the land of the living. Then his name be remembered no more. But, O Lord of hosts, who judges righteously, who tests the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance upon them. For to you have I committed my cause. The Lord is merciful. Thanks be to God. Fear the Lord, you his saying. For those who fear him lack nothing. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. O Lord, delivers him out of them all. The epistle readings found in James chapter 3. Who is wise and understanding amongst you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. What causes quarrels and what causes fights amongst you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and do not obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it is of no purpose that the scripture says, he yearns jealousy over the might of he yearns jealousy over the spirit that he was made to dwell in us, but he gives more than grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will free from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. The Lord have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. If anyone would be first. Let's serve my mom. Hallelujah. Please rise for the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to Saint Mark, the ninth chapter. They went on from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent for... On the way, they had been arguing with one another about who was the greatest. 
And he sat down and he called the 12 and he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. The Lord have mercy on us. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our readings for today include readings again from James. James is one of those books that was contentious in the early church. And it was until about the fourth century that it actually was accepted as being the inspired word. Luther didn't have much good to say about it either because he didn't see a lot of grace in it. He saw a lot of law, law that tells you what to do. But now we're going to flip things a little bit and see that the law is really grace. You see, God told us what we're supposed to do. He did that to protect us. He did that so that we could live in his presence. Our first parents didn't run from the devil. They listened. And they didn't trust what God said. They trusted what Satan said. And it may have been part of the, the way in which the answer back, we're not even to touch it. That that was not, that was a fence around the, the fence, if you would. They were told not to eat of the fruit. And it wasn't said, you can't touch it. So I have in this picture of my mind, at least, the uh, Satan as the snake sliding up next to the fruit and touching it. It's going to be okay. And it's going to give you wisdom. And you're going to know the difference between right and wrong. You're going to be like God. Now, that have been a good time to run away. To flee the devil. But that didn't happen. And so sin came into the world because our first parents did not trust God's word. And when you heard the answers when he came back and he said, what'd you do? They answered him, well, actually it was Adam that answered, that woman that you gave me she gave me of the fruit and I ate it. So it was God's fault and the woman's fault. And therein, I believe, in my whole heart, is where man was required to answer for the family. God says, you're not going to do that again. You're responsible for your family. Well, Our text for today in the gospel, you have Jesus telling his disciples that he must be killed. This is the second time now that he's telling them that. They told him that when they were up in the area of Caesarea Philippi. And now again. Well, the disciples didn't understand it. That's pretty plain words that we're reading. Why didn't they understand it? Because they didn't want to. You know, much like ourselves. We know what we've heard, but we don't want it to be. That's sin dwelling in us. Even though you're baptized and you're a member of Christ's family, through your baptism, 
still you're simultaneously saints and sinners. And this temptation to sin and this failure to do what's right continues to drag you down. Make life difficult. And so we become worldly. We want the things that we want. The things that look good, exciting, fun. We don't want those things that would be difficult, tasteless. And yet, in our world, how do we get those? Do we do we get them um, by hook or crook? Do we focus ourselves on what we want? Well, that's what James is talking about. And that's where the law is good because it tells us what is going wrong. And so, what is the answer there? God will supply your needs. He will supply your wants if that's what he wants for you. But you have to trust him. You have to trust his word. The, the whole life experience for us is to learn to trust God. And Christ's life experience was to die on the cross for you and me to live a perfect life. Yes, an example, but we don't live by examples. He lived a perfect life and died on the cross to pay for your sins, all your mistakes, mine too. Right. Every one of them, for every human being, has the possibility, at least, of going to heaven to be with him. He says, why is that your goal? I want right now the stuff that I want. Why is your goal to go to heaven? That's out in the by and by. Well, if you live a life that has a uh, not been too protected. You know that life can be called home at any moment. And you you realize that and you see that and you experience that whether that person is a young person or an old person. It comes all of a sudden. And it's the next stage in life eternal for those who believe in Christ. That's why he died on the cross. So that you could spend eternity with him. Well, how great is that? What is it that reason why I want to go to heaven other than I don't want to live forever and I don't want to die? That's us, our human being. But if you love your life so much that you hang on to it, Christ tells us you'll lose it. Your life is more than just you. It's about your fellow mankind, your partners, your neighbors, your children, those you come in contact with. So Jesus made the Ten Commandments easy for us. He said, love God with your whole heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And where do we have our problems with one another? Because we love ourselves more than we love our neighbor, if at all. That's part of the problem. Christ died as a solution to remove that sin and that guilt. And if we believe and trust in him, he says, you are truly my disciples if you keep my commandments. He also says, be faithful unto death and I'll give you a crown of life. But let's not forget what that crown of life means. It means to be in the presence of the most beautiful, wonderful being in the entire universe. 
It means a joy that cannot be expressed. It's so wonderful. A beauty that surpasses anything here on this earth. Anything out there that you look at in the galaxy that you can see with your telescopes and the like. And there's a lot of beauty out there. God's creation is wonderful and it gives you just a little idea of what he is. And if you remember, David said the only thing he really wanted was to be in God's presence and behold his beauty. In the book of Revelation, we hear about how being in his presence, he is the son in the new Jerusalem. He is the temple. God is everything, and we are part of what he does. And yet we're individuals. We're not consumed into something. We're each individuals, and we love one another because he first loved us. This is not all about us that anymore. It's about how do we help them? Now, he does not say, don't love yourself. But he does say, and we hear it in the, the gospel lesson today, don't put yourself forward. Don't be this great, wonderful cheerleader of yourself. That's not the way we work. In the kingdom of God, how a person is to, to lead, to rule, to serve others. But you're to be the greatest servant, then you'll be something. You'll be loved. Now, I've been to a few funerals, conducted more than I would like to think about. It's those who have loved and given to others who are the ones that are praised and held up. This world, and it'll be the same in the world to come. The good works that you do will be works that have worked from you because God is working in your heart. Not those works that you did so that you'd get recognition or that you could get advancement. Now, I'm not saying don't do those things. Don't misunderstand this. You are to become the best of what you can be, but don't be proud. You know, we have examples in our public life of people who, because of their pride, are resisted. They may do wonderful work, have great ideas, but because of their pride, you want to step away from them. Now, that's what the Jesus is telling. You want to be a leader? You, you want to make a difference in this world? Make a difference right where you're at. Serving the people right where you're at. And in due course, God will raise you up. Be satisfied with what you have. If you're not satisfied with what you have, you're going to fall in that trap of greed. You become part of the world. Now, I'm not talking about the world that God created and not his governance. I'm talking about the world that you and I live in each day, in the neighbors and in we, what we do and how we do it. Because if we have all the answers, we don't listen. And we're not open. We need each other because without each other, we don't accomplish much here in this life or for the life to come. We have to work together. 
Now, Christ died on a cross, and I I hear that on the television. I see that commercial. You know, the blood of Jesus covers you. You know, that's code words for people that understand and have a theological background, but those people who don't have a theological background, I got a feeling that really turns them off. Understand that Jesus died on the cross so that your sins are paid for and that you have sins and you will have sins and you will continue to sin until you die. And that's why we need to be constantly asking for God's forgiveness, recognizing the sins that we have done. That's not what gets you forgiven. That's not what gets you saved. It's Christ who gets you saved. He's the one that has done the things necessary for you, all that is necessary for you to be saved. So the good works that you end up doing, you doing, and you will get uh, rewarded for someday in heaven, but you do them because you want to, not because I have to, because this rule says this, and this rule says this. No, we don't live under the law anymore. We live under grace. We live under the love and the forgiveness of God that has been bought for us from Jesus Christ. Now, this is going to go for a little bit, sadly, a little longer yet, because we need to understand. You see, God cannot have sin in his presence. He can't condone your sin. He can't say, oh, it's okay. Try again. He can't be the little old grandpa. That's me, all right? But you see, if he did that, he would be partaking in your sin. He would be condoning what you did. Then he would take evil into his being, and his wrath will not allow that. It'll protect him from that. And that's why those who stand before him in sin will be destroyed. It's that simple. That's why Jesus came. Because he acts like an umbrella. The wrath is falling all around you. You got the umbrella up and the rain is not coming in on you. He is protecting you. He says, you're righteous. Your sins are forgiven. You're declared righteous. And you should live as righteously as you can to show your love for him for what he has done for you. But never let that become something that Satan uses to break your faith in what Christ has done for you. How do you flee from Satan? Well, you go to God. You go and trust him. And you give him thanks and praise because... He's done what you need done for you. He will save you. He has promised and he never breaks his promises. His word is good. Amen. The peace of God with path is all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in true faith until life everlasting. Let us depart in his peace. Amen.